Chapter 45 Population and Community Ecology Figure 45.1 Asian Carp Jump Out of the Water in Response to Electrofishing The Asian carp in the photograph on the right were harvested from the Little Calumet River in Illinois in May, 2010, using rotenone, a toxin often used as an insecticide, in an effort to learn more about the population of the species. Credit left image. Modification of work by USGS. Credit right image. Modification of work by Lt. David French, USCG. Introduction Imagine sailing down a river in a small motorboat on a weekend afternoon. The water is smooth and you are enjoying the warm sunshine and cool breeze when suddenly you are hit in the head by a 20-pound silver carp. This is now a risk on many rivers and canal systems in Illinois and Missouri because of the presence of Asian carp. This fish. Actually a group of species including the silver, black, grass, and bighead carp has been farmed and eaten in China for over 1,000 years. It is one of the most important aquaculture food resources worldwide. In the United States, however, Asian carp is considered a dangerous invasive species that disrupts community structure and composition to the point of threatening native species. Chapter Outline 45.1 Population Demography 45.2 Life Histories and Natural Selection 45.3 Environmental Limits to Population Growth 45.4 Population Dynamics and Regulation 45.5 Human Population Growth 45.6 Community Ecology 45.7 Behavioral Biology Proximate and Ultimate Causes of Behavior 45.1 Population Demography By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Describe how ecologists measure population size and density. Describe three different patterns of population distribution. Use life tables to calculate mortality rates. Describe the three types of survivorship curves and relate them to specific populations. Populations are dynamic entities. Populations consist all of the species living within a specific area, and populations fluctuate based on a number of factors. Seasonal and yearly changes in the environment natural disasters such as forest fires and volcanic eruptions, and competition for resources between and within species. The statistical study of population dynamics, demography, uses a series of mathematical tools to investigate how populations respond to changes in their biotic and abiotic environments. Many of these tools were originally designed to study human populations. For example, life tables, which detail the life expectancy of individuals within a population, were initially developed by life insurance companies to set insurance rates. In fact, while the term demographics is commonly used when discussing humans, all living populations can be studied using this approach. Population size and density The study of any population usually begins by determining how many individuals of a particular species exist, and how closely associated they are with each other. Within a particular habitat, a population can be characterized by its population size, n, the total number of individuals, and its population density, the number of individuals within a specific area or volume. Population size and density are the two main characteristics used to describe and understand populations. For example, populations with more individuals may be more stable than smaller populations based on their genetic variability, and thus their potential to adapt to the environment. Alternatively, a member of a population with low population density, more spread out in the habitat, might have more difficulty finding a mate to reproduce compared to a population of higher density. As is shown in figure 45.2, smaller organisms tend to be more densely distributed than larger organisms. Visual connection figure 45.2 Australian mammals show a typical inverse relationship between population density and body size. As this graph shows, population density typically decreases with increasing body size. Why do you think this 1296 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org? Is the case? Population research methods The most accurate way to determine population size is to simply count all of the individuals within the habitat. However, this method is often not logistically or economically feasible, especially when studying large habitats. Thus, scientists usually study populations by sampling a representative portion of each habitat and using this data to make inferences about the habitat as a whole. A variety of methods can be used to sample populations to determine their size and density. For immobile organisms such as plants, or for very small and slow-moving organisms, a quadrat may be used, figure 45.3.
A quadrat is a way of marking off square areas within a habitat, either by staking out an area with sticks and string, or by the use of a wood, plastic, or metal square placed on the ground. After setting the quadrats, researchers then count the number of individuals that lie within their boundaries. Multiple quadrat samples are performed throughout the habitat at several random locations to estimate the population size and density within the entire habitat. The number and size of quadrat samples depends on the type of organisms under study and other factors, including the density of the organism. For example, if sampling daffodils, a 1 square meter quadrat might be used. With giant redwoods, on the other hand, a larger quadrat of 100 square meters might be employed. This ensures that enough individuals of the species are counted to get an accurate sample that correlates with the habitat, including areas not sampled. Figure 45.3A scientist uses a quadrat to measure population size and density. Credit. NPS Sonoran Desert Network, for mobile organisms, such as mammals, birds, or fish, scientists use a technique called mark and recapture. This method involves marking a sample of captured animals. In some way, such as tags, bands, paint, or other body markings, and then releasing them back into the environment to allow them to mix with the rest of the population. Later, researchers collect a new sample, including some individuals that are marked, recaptures, and some individuals that are unmarked, figure 45.4. Figure 45.4 mark and recapture is used to measure the population size of mobile animals such as a bighorn sheep, b the California condor, and c salmon. Credit a modification of work by Neil Herbert, NPS. Credit b. Modification of work by Pacific Southwest Region USFWS. Credit C. Modification of work by Ingrid Taylor. Using the ratio of marked and unmarked individuals, scientists determine how many individuals are in the sample. From this, calculations are used to estimate the total population size. This method assumes that the larger the population, the lower the percentage of tagged organisms that will be recaptured since they will have mixed with more untagged individuals. For example, 45.1, population demography 1297 if 80 deer are captured, tagged, and released into the forest, and later 100 deer are captured and 20 of them are already marked, we can estimate the population size, n, using the following equation. Using our example, the population size would be estimated at 400. Therefore, there are an estimated 400 total individuals in the original population. There are some limitations to the mark and recapture method. Some animals from the first catch may learn to avoid capture in the second round, thus inflating population estimates. Alternatively, some animals may prefer to be retrapped, especially if a food reward is offered, resulting in an underestimate of population size. Also, some species may be harmed by the marking technique, reducing their survival. A variety of other techniques have been developed including the electronic tracking of animals tagged with radio transmitters and the use of data from commercial fishing and trapping operations to estimate the size and health of populations and communities. Species distribution in addition to measuring simple density, further information about a population can be obtained by looking at the distribution of the individuals. Species dispersion patterns, or distribution patterns, show the spatial relationship between members of a population within a habitat at a particular point in time. In other words, they show whether members of the species live close together or far apart, and what patterns are evident when they are spaced apart. Individuals in a population can be equally spaced apart, dispersed randomly with no predictable pattern, or clustered in groups. These are known as uniform, random, and clump dispersion patterns, respectively, figure 45.5. Uniform dispersion is observed in plants that secrete substances inhibiting the growth of nearby individuals, such as the release of toxic chemicals by the sage plant. Salvia leucophila, a phenomenon called allelopathy, and in animals like the penguin that maintain a defined territory. An example of random dispersion occurs with dandelion and other plants that have wind-dispersed seeds that germinate wherever they happen to fall in a favorable environment. A clump dispersion may be seen in plants that drop their seeds straight to the ground, such as oak trees, or in animals that live in groups, schools of fish or herds of elephants. Clump dispersions may also be a function of habitat heterogeneity. Thus, the dispersion of the individuals within a population provides more information about how they interact with each other than does a simple density measurement.
Just as lower density species might have more difficulty finding a mate, solitary species with a random distribution might have a similar difficulty when compared to social species clumped together in groups. Figure 45.5 species may have uniform, random, or clumped distribution. Territorial birds such as penguins tend to have uniform distribution. Plants such as dandelions with wind-dispersed seeds tend to be randomly distributed. Animals such as elephants that travel in groups exhibit clump distribution. Credit A. Modification of work by Ben Tubby. Credit B. Modification of work by Rosendahl. Credit C. Modification of work by Rebecca Wood. Demography while population size and density describe a population at one particular point in time. Scientists must use demography to 1298 Chapter 45. Population and Community Ecology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Study the dynamics of a population. Demography is the statistical study of population changes over time. Birth rates, death rates, and life expectancies. Each of these measures, especially birth rates, may be affected by the population characteristics described above. For example, a large population size results in a higher birth rate because more potentially reproductive individuals are present. In contrast, a large population size can also result in a higher death rate because of competition, disease, and the accumulation of waste. Similarly, a higher population density or a clump dispersion pattern results in more potential reproductive encounters between individuals, which can increase birth rate. Lastly, a female biased sex ratio, the ratio of males to females, or age structure, the proportion of population members at specific age ranges, composed of many individuals of reproductive age can increase birth rates. In addition, the demographic characteristics of a population can influence how the population grows or declines over time. If birth and death rates are equal, the population remains stable. However, the population size will increase if birth rates exceed death rates. The population will decrease if birth rates are less than death rates. Life expectancy is another important factor. The length of time individuals remain in. The population impacts local resources, reproduction, and the overall health of the population. These demographic characteristics are often displayed in the form of a life table. Life tables Life tables provide important information about the life history of an organism. Life tables divide the population into age groups and often sexes, and show how long a member of that group is likely to live. They are modeled after actuarial tables used by the insurance industry for estimating human life expectancy. Life tables may include the probability of individuals dying before their next birthday, i.e., their mortality rate, the percentage of surviving individuals dying at a particular age interval, and their life expectancy at each interval. An example of a life table is shown in Table 45.1 from a study of Dahl Mountain Sheep, a species native to northwestern North America. Notice that the population is divided into age intervals, column A. The mortality rate, per 1,000, shown in column D, is based on the number of individuals dying during the age interval, column B, divided by the number of individuals surviving at the beginning of the interval, column C, multiplied by 1,000. For example, between ages 3 and 4, 12 individuals die out of the 776 that were remaining from the original 1,000 sheep. This number is then multiplied by 1,000 to get the mortality rate per 1,000. As can be seen from the mortality rate data, column D, a high death rate occurred when the sheep were between 6 and 12 months old, and then increased even more from 8 to 12 years old, after which there were few survivors. The data indicate that if a sheep in this population were to survive to age 1, it could be expected to live another 7.7 .7 years on average, as shown by the life expectancy numbers in column E life table of Dahl Mountain Sheep 1 age interval. Years. Number dying in age interval out of 1,000 born number surviving at beginning of age interval out of 1,000 born mortality rate per 1,000 alive at beginning of age interval life expectancy or mean lifetime remaining to those attaining age interval 0 0.554, 1,000, 54.07.060.5-1,145,946,153.3, 801, 15.07.72, 3, 13, 789, 16.56.8, Table 45.1. This life table of Ovis Dali shows the number of deaths. 
number of survivors, mortality rate, and life expectancy at one data adapted from Edward S. D. V. Jr. Life Tables for Natural Populations of Animals, The Quarterly Review of Biology 22, No. 4, December 1947, 45.1, Population Demography 1299 Age Interval, Years, Number dying in age interval out of 1,000 born number surviving at beginning of age interval out of 1,000 born mortality rate per 1,000 alive at beginning of age interval life expectancy or mean lifetime remaining to those attaining age interval. This life table of Ovis Daly shows the number of deaths, number of survivors, mortality rate, and life expectancy at each age interval for the doll mountain sheep. Survivorship curves Another tool used by population ecologists is a survivorship curve which is a graph of the number of individuals surviving at each age interval plotted versus time, usually with data compiled from a life table. These curves allow us to compare the life histories of different populations, figure 45.6. Humans and most primates exhibit a type 1 survivorship curve because a high percentage of offspring survive their early and middle years. Death occurs predominantly in older individuals. These types of species usually have small numbers of offspring at one time and they give a high amount of parental care to them to ensure their survival. Birds are an example of an intermediate or type 2 survivorship curve because birds die more or less equally at each age interval. These organisms also may have relatively few offspring and provide significant parental care. Trees, marine invertebrates, and most fishes exhibit a type 3 survivorship curve because very few of these organisms survive their younger years. However, those that make it to an old age are more likely to survive for a relatively long period of time. Organisms in this category usually have a very large number of offspring, but once they are born, little parental care is provided. Thus these offspring are, on their own, and vulnerable to predation, but their sheer numbers assure the survival of enough individuals to perpetuate the species. 283 to 314. 1300 Chapter 45. Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org Figure 45.6 Survivorship Curves show the distribution of individuals in a population according to age. Humans and most mammals have a type 1 survivorship curve because death primarily occurs in the older years. Birds have a type 2 survivorship curve, as death at any age is equally probable. Trees have a type 3 survivorship curve because very few survive the younger years, but after a certain age, Individuals are much more likely to survive. 45.2 Life Histories and Natural Selection By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Describe how life history patterns are influenced by natural selection. Explain different life history patterns and how different reproductive strategies affect species survival A species life history describes the series of events over its lifetime, such as how resources are allocated for growth, maintenance, and reproduction. Life history traits affect the life table of an organism. A species life history is genetically determined and shaped by the environment and natural selection. Life history patterns and energy budgets Energy is required by all living organisms for their growth, maintenance, and reproduction. At the same time, energy is often a major limiting factor in determining an organism's survival. Plants, for example, acquire energy from the sun via photosynthesis but must expend this energy to grow, maintain health, and produce energy-rich seeds to produce the next generation. Animals have the additional burden of using some of their energy reserves to acquire food. Furthermore, some animals must expend energy caring for their offspring. Thus, all species have an energy budget. They must balance energy intake with their use of energy for metabolism, reproduction, parental care, and energy storage, such as bears building up body fat for winter hibernation. Parental care and fecundity Fecundity is the potential reproductive capacity of an individual within a population. In other words, fecundity describes how many offspring could ideally be produced if an individual has as many offspring as possible, repeating the reproductive cycle as soon as possible after the birth of the offspring. In animals, fecundity is inversely related to the amount of parental care given to an individual offspring. Species, such as many marine invertebrates, that produce many offspring usually provide little if any care for the offspring, they would not have the energy or the ability to do so anyway. Most of their energy budget is used to produce many tiny offspring. Animals with this strategy are often self-sufficient at a very early age. This is because of the energy trade-off these organisms have made to maximize their evolutionary fitness. 
Because their energy is used for producing offspring instead of parental care, it makes sense that these offspring have some ability to be able to move within their environment and find food and perhaps shelter. Even with these abilities, their small size makes them extremely vulnerable to predation, so the production of many offspring allows enough of them to survive to maintain the species. Animal species that have few offspring during a reproductive event usually give extensive parental care, devoting much of their energy budget to these activities, sometimes at the expense of their own health. This is the case with many mammals, such as humans, kangaroos, and pandas. The offspring of these species are relatively helpless at birth and need to develop before they 45.2, life histories and natural selection 1301 achieve self-sufficiency. Plants with low fecundity produce few energy-rich seeds, such as coconuts and chestnuts, with each having a good chance to germinate into a new organism. Plants with high fecundity usually have many small, energy-poor seeds, like orchids, that have a relatively poor chance of surviving. Although it may seem that coconuts and chestnuts have a better chance of surviving, the energy trade-off of the orchid is also very effective. It is a matter of where the energy is used, for large numbers of seeds or for fewer seeds with more energy. Early versus late reproduction The timing of reproduction in a life history also affects species survival. Organisms that reproduce at an early age have a greater chance of producing offspring, but this is usually at the expense of their growth and the maintenance of their health. Conversely, organisms that start reproducing later in life often have greater fecundity or are better able to provide parental care, but they risk that they will not survive to reproductive age. Examples of this can be seen in fishes. Small fish, like guppies, use their energy to reproduce rapidly, but never attain the size that would give them defense against some predators. Larger fish, like the bluegill or shark, use their energy to attain a large size, but do so with the risk that they will die before they can reproduce or at least reproduce to their maximum. These different energy strategies and trade-offs are key to understanding the evolution of each species as it maximizes its fitness and fills its niche. In terms of energy budgeting, some species blow it all and use up most of their energy reserves to reproduce early before they die. Other species delay having reproduction to become stronger, more experienced individuals and to make sure that they are strong enough to provide parental care if necessary. Single versus multiple reproductive events Some life history traits, such as fecundity, timing of reproduction, and parental care, can be grouped together into general strategies that are used by multiple species. Semelparity occurs when a species reproduces only once during its lifetime and then dies. Such species use most of their resource budget during a single reproductive event, sacrificing their health to the point that they do not survive. Examples of semelparity are bamboo, which flowers once and then dies, and the Chinook salmon, figure 45.7a, which uses most of its energy reserves to migrate from the ocean to its freshwater nesting area, where it reproduces and then dies. Scientists have posited alternate explanations for the evolutionary advantage of the Chinook's post-reproduction death, a programmed suicide caused by a massive release of corticosteroid hormones, presumably so the parents can become food for the offspring or simple exhaustion caused by the energy demands of reproduction. These are still being debated. Iteraparity describes species that reproduce repeatedly during their lives. Some animals are able to mate only once per year, but survive multiple mating seasons. The pronghorn antelope is an example of an animal that goes into a seasonal estrus cycle, heat, a hormonal-induced physiological condition preparing the body for successful mating, figure 45.7b. Females of these species mate only during the estrus phase of the cycle. A different pattern is observed in primates, including humans and chimpanzees which may attempt reproduction at any time during their reproductive years, even though their menstrual cycles make pregnancy likely only a few days per month during ovulation, figure 45.7c. Figure 45.7 The uh, Chinook salmon mates once and dies. The b pronghorn antelope mates during specific times of the year during its reproductive life. Primates, such as humans and c chimpanzees, may mate on any day, independent of ovulation. Credit a modification of work by Roger Tabor, USFWS. Credit B. Modification of work by Mark Gock, USDA. Credit C. Modification of work by Shiny Things, Flickr. Link to learning play this interactive PBS evolution-based mating game, 
http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash mating underscore game closing parenthesis to learn more about reproductive strategies. 1302 Chapter 45 Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStacks.org Evolution Connection Energy Budgets, Reproductive Costs, and Sexual Selection in Drosophila Research into How Animals Allocate Their Energy Resources for Growth, Maintenance, and Reproduction has used a variety of experimental animal models. Some of this work has been done using the common fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Studies have shown that not only does reproduction have a cost as far as how long male fruit flies live, but also fruit flies that have already mated several times have limited sperm remaining for reproduction. Fruit flies maximize their last chances at reproduction by selecting optimal mates. In a 1981 study, male fruit flies were placed in enclosures with either virgin or inseminated females. The males that mated with virgin females had shorter lifespans than those in contact with the same number of inseminated females with which they were unable to mate. This effect occurred regardless of how large, indicative of their age, the males were. Thus, males that did not mate lived longer, allowing them more opportunities to find mates in the future. More recent studies, performed in 2006, show how males select the female with which they will mate and how this is affected by previous matings. Figure 45.8. Point 2 males were allowed to select between smaller and larger females. Findings showed that larger females had greater fecundity, producing twice as many offspring per mating as the smaller females did. Males that had previously mated, and thus, had lower supplies of sperm, were termed, resource depleted, while males that had not mated were termed, non-resource depleted. The study showed that although non-resource depleted males preferentially mated with larger females, this selection of partners was more pronounced in the resource depleted males. Thus, males with depleted sperm supplies, which were limited in the number of times that they could mate before they replenished their sperm supply, selected larger, more fecund females, thus maximizing their chances for offspring. This study was one of the first to show that the physiological state of the male affected its mating behavior in a way that clearly maximizes its use of limited reproductive resources. Figure 45.8 Male fruit flies that had previously mated, sperm depleted, picked larger, more fecund females more often than those that had not mated, non-sperm depleted. This change in behavior causes an increase in the efficiency of a limited reproductive resource, sperm. These studies demonstrate two ways in which the energy budget is a factor in reproduction. First, energy expended on mating may reduce an animal's lifespan, but by this time they have already reproduced. So in the context of natural selection this early death is not of much evolutionary importance. Second, when resources such as sperm, and the energy needed to replenish it, are low, an organism's behavior can change to give them the best chance of passing their genes on to the next generation. These changes in behavior, so important to evolution, are studied in a discipline known as behavioral biology, or ethology, at the interface between population biology and psychology. 45.3 Environmental Limits to Population Growth By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Explain the characteristics of and differences between exponential and logistic growth patterns. Give examples of exponential and logistic growth in natural populations. Describe how natural selection and environmental adaptation led to the evolution of particular life history patterns although life histories describe the way many characteristics of a population, such as their age structure, change over time in a general way. Population ecologists make use of a variety of methods to model population dynamics mathematically. These more too adapted from Philip G. Byrne and William R. Rice. Evidence for adaptive male mate choice in the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, Proc Bile Psi. 273, No. 1589, 2006, 917-922, doi. 10.1098, RSPB.2005.3372. 45.3. Environmental limits to population growth. 1303 precise models can then be used to accurately describe changes occurring in a population and better predict future changes. Certain long accepted models are now being modified or even abandoned due to their lack of predictive ability, and scholars strive to create effective new models. Exponential growth. Charles Darwin, in his theory of natural selection, was greatly influenced by the English clergyman Thomas Malthus. 
Malthus published a book in 1798 stating that populations with unlimited natural resources grow very rapidly, and then population growth decreases as resources become depleted. This accelerating pattern of increasing population size is called exponential growth. The best example of exponential growth is seen in bacteria. Bacteria reproduce by prokaryotic fission. This division takes about an hour for many bacterial species. If 1,000 bacteria are placed in a large flask with an unlimited supply of nutrients, so the nutrients will not become depleted, after an hour, there is one round of division and each organism divides, resulting in 2,000 organisms, an increase of 1,000. In another hour, each of the 2,000 organisms will double, producing 4,000, an increase of 2,000 organisms. After the third hour, there should be 8,000 bacteria in the flask, an increase of 4,000 organisms. The important concept of exponential growth is the accelerating population growth rate, the number of organisms added in each reproductive generation, that is, it is increasing at a greater and greater rate. After one day and 24 of these cycles, the population would have increased from 1,000 to more than 16 billion. When the population size, n, is plotted over time, a J-shaped growth curve is produced, figure 45.9. The bacteria example is not representative of the real world where resources are limited. Furthermore, some bacteria will die during the experiment and thus not reproduce, lowering the growth rate. Therefore, when calculating the growth rate of a population, the death rate, d, number organisms that die during a particular time interval, is subtracted from the birth rate, b, number organisms that are born during that interval. This is shown in the following formula. The birth rate is usually expressed on a per capita, for each individual, basis. Thus, B, birth rate, equals BN, the per capita birth rate, B, multiplied by the number of individuals, N, and D, death rate, equals DN, the per capita death rate, D, multiplied by the number of individuals, N. Additionally, ecologists are interested in the population at a particular point in time, an infinitely small time interval. For this reason, the terminology of differential calculus is used to obtain the instantaneous growth rate, replacing the change in number and time with an instant-specific measurement of number and time. Notice that the d associated with the first term refers to the derivative, as the term is used in calculus, and is different from the death rate, also called d. The difference between birth and death rates is further simplified by substituting the term r intrinsic rate of increase. For the relationship between birth and death rates, the value r can be positive, meaning the population is increasing in size, or negative, meaning the population is decreasing in size, or zero, where the population size is unchanging, a condition known as zero population growth. A further refinement of the formula recognizes that different species have inherent differences in their intrinsic rate of increase, often thought of as the potential for reproduction, even under ideal conditions. Obviously, a bacterium can reproduce more rapidly and have a higher intrinsic rate of growth than a human. The maximal growth rate for a species is its biotic potential, or R max, thus changing the equation to 1304 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Figure 45.9 When resources are unlimited, populations exhibit exponential growth, resulting in a J-shaped curve. When resources are limited, populations exhibit logistic growth. In logistic growth, population expansion decreases as resources become scarce, and it levels off when the carrying capacity of the environment is reached, resulting in an S-shaped curve. Logistic growth exponential growth is possible only when infinite natural resources are available. This is not the case in the real world. Charles Darwin recognized this fact in his description of the struggle for existence which states that individuals will compete, with members of their own or other species, for limited resources. The successful ones will survive to pass on their own characteristics and traits, which we know now are transferred by genes, to the next generation at a greater rate, natural selection. To model the reality of limited resources, population ecologists developed the logistic growth model. Carrying capacity and the logistic model in the real world, with its limited resources, exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely. Exponential growth may occur in environments where there are few individuals and plentiful resources, but when the number of individuals gets large enough, resources will be depleted, slowing the growth rate. Eventually, the growth rate will plateau or level off, 
Figure 45.9. This population size, which represents the maximum population size that a particular environment can support, is called the carrying capacity, or K. The formula we use to calculate logistic growth adds the carrying capacity as a moderating force in the growth rate. The expression K, N, indicates how many individuals may be added to a population at a given stage, and K, N, divided by K, is the fraction of the carrying capacity available for further growth. Thus, the exponential growth model is restricted by this factor to generate the logistic growth equation. Notice that when N is very small, K, N, K becomes close to K, K or 1, and the right side of the equation reduces to RMAXN, which means the population is growing exponentially and is not influenced by carrying capacity. On the other hand, when N is large, KN, K comes close to 0, which means that population growth will be slowed greatly or even stopped. Thus, population growth is greatly slowed in large populations by the carrying capacity K. This model also allows for the population of a negative population growth, or a population decline. This occurs when the number of individuals in the population exceeds the carrying capacity, because the value of kn, k is negative. A graph of this equation yields an S-shaped curve, figure 45.9, and it is a more realistic model of population growth than exponential growth. There are three different sections to an S-shaped curve. Initially, growth is exponential because there are few individuals and ample resources available. Then, as resources begin to become limited, the growth rate decreases. Finally, growth levels off at the carrying capacity of the environment, with little change in population size over time. Role of intraspecific competition The logistic model assumes that every individual within a population will have equal access to resources and, thus, an equal chance for survival. For plants, the amount of water, sunlight, nutrients, and the space to grow are the important resources, whereas in animals, important resources include food, water, shelter, nesting space, and mates. 45.3, Environmental Limits to Population Growth 1305 in the Real World Phenotypic variation among individuals within a population means that some individuals will be better adapted to their environment than others. The resulting competition between population members of the same species for resources is termed intraspecific competition, intra equals, within, specific equals, species. Intraspecific competition for resources may not affect populations that are well below their carrying capacity, resources are plentiful and all individuals can obtain what they need. However, as population size increases, this competition intensifies. In addition, the accumulation of waste products can reduce an environment's carrying capacity. Examples of logistic growth yeast, a microscopic fungus used to make bread and alcoholic beverages, exhibits the classical S-shaped curve when grown in a test tube, figure 45.10a. Its growth levels off as the population depletes the nutrients. In the real world, however, there are variations to this idealized curve. Examples in wild populations include sheep and harbor seals, figure 45.10b. In both examples, the population size exceeds the carrying capacity for short periods of time and then falls below the carrying capacity afterwards. This fluctuation in population size continues to occur as the population oscillates around its carrying capacity. Still, even with this oscillation, the logistic model is confirmed. Visual Connection Figure 45.10 uh. Yeast grown in ideal conditions in a test tube show a classical S-shaped logistic growth curve, whereas, b, a natural population of seals shows real-world fluctuation. If the major food source of the seals declines due to pollution or overfishing, which of the following would likely occur? 1306 Chapter 45 Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStacks.org A. The carrying capacity of seals would decrease, as would the seal population. b. The carrying capacity of seals would decrease, but the seal population would remain the same. c. The number of seal deaths would increase but the number of births would also increase, so the population size would remain the same. d. The carrying capacity of seals would remain the same, but the population of seals would decrease. 45.4 Population Dynamics and Regulation By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Give examples of how the carrying capacity of a habitat may change. 
Compare and contrast density-dependent growth regulation and density-independent growth regulation. Giving examples. Give examples of exponential and logistic growth in wild animal populations. Describe how natural selection and environmental adaptation leads to the evolution of particular life history patterns the logistic model of population growth, while valid in many natural populations and a useful model, is a simplification of real-world population dynamics. Implicit in the model is that the carrying capacity of the environment does not change, which is not the case. The carrying capacity varies annually. For example, some summers are hot and dry whereas others are cold and wet. In many areas, the carrying capacity during the winter is much lower than it is during the summer. Also, natural events such as earthquakes, volcanoes, and fires can alter an environment and hence its carrying capacity. Additionally, populations do not usually exist in isolation. They engage in interspecific competition. That is, they share the environment with other species competing for the same resources. These factors are also important to understanding how a specific population will grow. Nature regulates population growth in a variety of ways. These are grouped into density-dependent factors, in which the density of the population at a given time affects growth rate and mortality, and density-independent factors, which influence mortality in a population regardless of population density. Note that in the former, the effect of the factor on the population depends on the density of the population at onset. Conservation biologists want to understand both types because this helps them manage populations and prevent extinction or overpopulation. Density-dependent regulation Most density-dependent factors are biological in nature, biotic, and include predation, inter- and intraspecific competition, accumulation of waste, and diseases such as those caused by parasites. Usually, the denser a population is, the greater its mortality rate. For example, during intra- and interspecific competition, the reproductive rates of the individuals will usually be lower, reducing their population's rate of growth. In addition, low prey density increases the mortality of its predator because it has more difficulty locating its food source. An example of density-dependent regulation is shown in Figure 45.11 with results from a study focusing on the giant intestinal roundworm, Ascaris lumbricoides, a parasite of humans and other mammals. Three denser populations of the parasite exhibited lower fecundity, they contained fewer eggs. One possible explanation for this is that females would be smaller in more dense populations, due to limited resources, and that smaller females would have fewer eggs. This hypothesis was tested and disproved in a 2009 study which showed that female weight had no influence. For the actual cause of the density dependence of fecundity in this organism is still unclear and awaiting further investigation. 3 N. A. Kroll et al. The Population Biology and Control of Ascaris Lumbricoides in a Rural Community in Iran. Transactions of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene 76, No. 2, 1982, 187-197, doi. 10.1016-0035-9203-82-90272-3. 4. Martin Walker et al. Density-dependent effects on the weight of female Ascaris lumbricoides infections of humans and its impact on patterns of egg production. Parasites and Vectors 2, No. 11, February 2009, doi. 10. 1186-1756-3305-2-11. 45.4, Population Dynamics and Regulation 1307 Figure 45.11 In this population of roundworms, fecundity, number of eggs, decreases with population density. 5. Density Independent Regulation and Interaction with Density Dependent Factors Many factors, typically physical or chemical in nature, abiotic, influence the mortality of a population regardless of its density, including weather, natural disasters, and pollution. An individual deer may be killed in a forest fire regardless of how many deer happen to be in that area. Its chances of survival are the same whether the population density is high or low. The same holds true for cold winter weather. In real-life situations, population regulation is very complicated and density-dependent and independent factors can interact. A dense population that is reduced in a density-independent manner by some environmental factors will be able to recover differently than a sparse population. For example, 
A population of deer affected by a harsh winter will recover faster if there are more deer remaining to reproduce. Evolution connection Why did the woolly mammoth go extinct? Figure 45.12 The three photos include a 1916 mural of a mammoth herd from the American Museum of Natural History. B. The only stuffed mammoth in the world. From the Museum of Zoology located in St. Petersburg, Russia. And C. A one-month-old baby mammoth, named Liuba, discovered in Siberia in 2007. Credit A. Modification of work by Charles R. Knight. Credit B. Modification of work by Tanapin, Flickr. Credit C. Modification of work by Matt Howry. It's easy to get lost in the discussion about why dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. Was it due to a meteor slamming into Earth near the coast of modern-day Mexico? Or was it from some long-term weather cycle that is not yet understood? Scientists are continually exploring these and other theories. Woolly mammoths began to go extinct much more recently, when they shared the Earth with humans who were no different anatomically than humans today, figure 45.12. Mammoths survived in isolated island populations as recently as 1700 BC. We know a lot about these animals from carcasses found frozen in the ice of Siberia and other regions of the north. Scientists have sequenced at least 50% of its genome and believe mammoths are between 98 and 99% identical to modern elephants. It is commonly thought that climate change and human hunting led to their extinction. A 2008 study estimated that climate 5N, A, Kroll et al. The population biology and control of Ascaris lumbricoides in a rural community in Iran. Transactions of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene 76, No. 2, 1982, 187-197, doi. 10.1016, 9273 1308 Chapter 45 Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org Change reduced the mammoth's range from 3 million square miles 42,000 years ago to 310,000 square miles 6,000 years ago. 6. It is also well documented that humans hunted these animals. A 2012 study showed that no single factor was exclusively responsible for the extinction of these magnificent creatures. 7. In addition to human hunting, climate change, and reduction of habitat, these scientists demonstrated another important factor in the mammoth's extinction was the migration of humans across the Bering Strait to North America during the last ice age 20,000 years ago. The maintenance of stable populations was and is very complex, with many interacting factors determining the outcome. It is important to remember that humans are also part of nature. We once contributed to a species decline using only primitive hunting technology. Life histories of K-selected and R-selected species While reproductive strategies play a key role in life histories, they do not account for important factors like limited resources and competition. The regulation of population growth by these factors can be used to introduce a classical concept in population biology, that of K-selected versus R-selected species. The concept relates to a species' reproductive strategies, habitat, and behavior especially in the way that they obtain resources and care for their young. It includes length of life and survivorship factors as well. Population biologists have grouped species into the two large categories, K-selected and R-selected, although the categories are really two ends of a continuum. K-selected species are species selected by stable, predictable environments. Populations of K-selected species tend to exist close to their carrying capacity. Hence the term K-selected, where intraspecific competition is high. These species have few, large offspring, a long gestation period, and often give long-term care to their offspring, table 45.2. While larger in size when born, the offspring are relatively helpless and immature at birth. By the time they reach adulthood, they must develop skills to compete for natural resources. In plants, scientists think of parental care more broadly. How long fruit takes to develop or how long it remains on the plant are determining factors in the time to the next reproductive event. Examples of K-selected species are primates, including humans, elephants, and plants such as oak trees, figure 45.13a. Oak trees grow very slowly and take, on average, 20 years to produce their first seeds, known as acorns. As many as 50,000 acorns can be produced by an individual tree, 
but the germination rate is low as many of these rot or are eaten by animals such as squirrels. In some years, oaks may produce an exceptionally large number of acorns, and these years may be on a two- or three-year cycle depending on the species of oak, our selection. As oak trees grow to a large size and for many years before they begin to produce acorns, they devote a large percentage of their energy budget to growth and maintenance. The tree's height and size allow it to dominate other plants in the competition for sunlight, the oak's primary energy resource. Furthermore, when it does reproduce, the oak produces large, energy-rich seeds that use their energy reserve to become quickly established, K selection. In contrast, our selected species have a large number of small offspring, hence their R designation, Table 45.2. This strategy is often employed in unpredictable or changing environments. Animals that are R-selected do not give long-term parental care and the offspring are relatively mature and self-sufficient at birth. Examples of R-selected species are marine invertebrates, such as jellyfish, and plants, such as the dandelion, figure 45.13b. Dandelions have small seeds that are wind-dispersed long distances. Many seeds are produced simultaneously to ensure that at least some of them reach a hospitable environment. Seeds that land in inhospitable environments have little chance for survival since their seeds are low in energy content. Note that survival is not necessarily a function of energy stored in the seed itself. 6. David Nogue's Bravo et al. Climate change, humans, and the extinction of the woolly mammoth. PLOS Bile 6, April 2008, E79, DOI, 10.1371, Journal. PBIO.0060079. 7 G. M. McDonald et al. Pattern of Extinction of the Woolly Mammoth in Beringia. Nature Communications 3, No. 893, June 2012, doi. 10.1038, NCOMS 1881. 45.4, Population Dynamics and Regulation 1309 Characteristics of K-Selected and R-Selected Species Characteristics of K-Selected Species Characteristics of R-Selected Species Mature Late Mature Early Greater Longevity Lower Longevity Increased Parental Care Decreased Parental Care Increased Competition Decreased Competition Fewer Offspring More Offspring Larger Offspring Smaller Offspring Table 45.2 Figure 45.13 Elephants are considered K-selected species as they live long, mature late, and provide long-term parental care to few offspring. Oak trees produce many offspring that do not receive parental care, but are considered K-selected species based on longevity and late maturation. b. Dandelions and jellyfish are both considered R-selected species as they mature early, have short lifespans, and produce many offspring that receive no parental care. Modern theories of life history by the second half of the 20th century, the concept of K and R selected species was used extensively and successfully to study populations. The R and K selection theory, although accepted for decades and used for much groundbreaking research, has now been reconsidered, and many population biologists have abandoned or modified it. Over the years, several studies attempted to confirm the theory, but these attempts have largely failed. Many species were identified that did not follow the 1310 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Theories Predictions. Furthermore, the theory ignored the age-specific mortality of the populations which scientists now know is very important. New demographic-based models of life history evolution have been developed which incorporate many ecological concepts included in R and K selection theory as well as population age structure and mortality factors. 45.5 Human population growth By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Discuss exponential human population growth. Explain how humans have expanded the carrying capacity of their habitat relate population growth and age structure to the level of economic development in different countries, discuss the long-term implications of unchecked human population growth population dynamics can be applied to human population growth. Earth's human population is growing rapidly, to the extent that some worry about the ability of the Earth's environment to sustain this population. Long-term exponential growth carries the potential risks of famine, disease, and large-scale death. Although humans have increased the carrying capacity of their environment, the technologies used to achieve this transformation have caused unprecedented changes to Earth's environment, altering ecosystems to the point where some may be in danger of collapse. The depletion of the ozone layer, 
erosion due to acid rain, and damage from global climate change are caused by human activities. The ultimate effect of these changes on our carrying capacity is unknown. As some point out, it is likely that the negative effects of increasing carrying capacity will outweigh the positive ones. The world's carrying capacity for human beings might actually decrease. The human population is currently experiencing exponential growth even though human reproduction is far below its biotic potential, figure 45.14. To reach its biotic potential, all females would have to become pregnant every nine months or so during their reproductive years. Also, resources would have to be such that the environment would support such growth. Neither of these two conditions exists. In spite of this fact, human population is still growing exponentially. Figure 45.14 Human population growth since 1000 AD is exponential, dark blue line. Notice that while the population in Asia, yellow line, which has many economically underdeveloped countries, is increasing exponentially, the population in Europe, light blue line, where most of the countries are economically developed, is growing much more slowly. A consequence of exponential human population growth is a reduction in time that it takes to add a particular number of humans to the Earth. Figure 45.15 shows that 123 years were necessary to add 1 billion humans in 1930, but it only took 24 years to add 2 billion people between 1975 and 1999. As already discussed, our ability to increase our carrying capacity indefinitely might be limited. Without new technological advances, the human growth rate has been predicted to slow in the coming decades. However, the population will still be increasing and the threat of overpopulation remains. 45.5, human population growth 1311 figure 45.15 The time between the addition of each billion human beings to Earth decreases over time. Credit. Modification of work. By Ryan T. Cragen. Link to learning click through this video http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash human underscore growth closing parenthesis of how human populations have changed over time overcoming density dependent regulation humans are unique in their ability to alter their environment with the conscious purpose of increasing carrying capacity this ability is a major factor responsible for human population growth and a way of overcoming density dependent growth regulation much of this ability is related to human intelligence, society, and communication. Humans can construct shelter to protect them from the elements and have developed agriculture and domesticated animals to increase their food supplies. In addition, humans use language to communicate this technology to new generations, allowing them to improve upon previous accomplishments. Other factors in human population growth are migration and public health. Humans originated in Africa, but have since migrated to nearly all inhabitable land on the earth. Public health, sanitation, and the use of antibiotics and vaccines have decreased the ability of infectious disease to limit human population growth. In the past, diseases such as the bubonic plaque of the 14th century killed between 30 and 60 percent of Europe's population and reduced the overall world population by as many as 100 million people. Today, the threat of infectious disease, while not gone, is certainly less severe. According to the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation IHME, in Seattle, global death from infectious disease declined from 15.4 million in 1990 to 10.4 million in 2017. To compare to some of the epidemics of the past, the percentage of the world's population killed between 1993 and 2002 decreased from 0.30% of the world's population to 0.14%. Thus, infectious disease influence on human population growth is becoming less significant. Age structure, population growth, and economic development The age structure of a population is an important factor in population dynamics. Age structure is the proportion of a population at different age ranges. Age structure allows better prediction of population growth, plus the ability to associate this growth with the level of economic development in the region. Countries with rapid growth have a pyramidal shape in their age structure diagrams, showing a preponderance of younger individuals, many of whom are of reproductive age or will be soon, figure 45.16. This pattern is most often observed in underdeveloped countries where individuals do not live to old age because of less than optimal living conditions. Age structures of areas with slow growth, including developed countries such as the United States, still have a pyramidal structure, 
but with many fewer young and reproductive aged individuals and a greater proportion of older individuals. Other developed countries, such as Italy, have zero population growth. The age structure of these populations is more conical, with an even greater percentage of middle aged and older individuals. The actual growth rates in different countries are shown in figure 45.17. With the highest rates tending to be in the less economically developed countries of 1312 Chapter 45. Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Africa and Asia. Visual Connection Figure 45.16 Typical Age Structure Diagrams are shown. The rapid growth diagram narrows to a point, indicating that the number of individuals decreases rapidly with age. In the slow growth model, the number of individuals decreases steadily with age. Stable population diagrams are rounded on the top, showing that the number of individuals per age group decreases gradually, and then increases for the older part of the population. Age structure diagrams for rapidly growing, slow growing, and stable populations are shown in stages 1 through 3. What type of population change do you think stage 4 represents? Figure 45.17 The percent growth rate of population in different countries is shown. Notice that the highest growth is occurring in less economically developed countries in Africa and Asia. Long term consequences of exponential human population growth Many dire predictions have been made about the world's population, leading to a major crisis called the population explosion. In the 1968 book The Population Bomb, biologist Dr. Paul R. Ehrlich wrote, The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. At this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. Eight, while many experts view this statement as incorrect based on evidence, the laws of exponential population growth are still in effect, and unchecked human population growth cannot continue indefinitely. Several nations have instituted policies aimed at influencing population. Efforts to control population growth led to the one child policy in China, which is now being phased out. India also implements national and regional populations to encourage family planning. On the other hand, Japan, Spain, Russia, Iran, and other countries have made efforts to increase population. 8 Paul R. Ehrlich, Prologue to the Population Bomb, 1968, Reaper, New York, Valentine, 1970. 45.5 Human population growth 1313 13 growth after birth rates dipped. Such policies are controversial, and the human population continues to grow. At some point, the food supply may run out, but the outcomes are difficult to predict. The United Nations estimates that future world population growth may vary from 6 billion, a decrease to 16 billion people by the year 2100. Another result of population growth is the endangerment of the natural environment. Many countries have attempted to reduce the human impact on climate change by reducing their emission of the greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide. However, these treaties have not been ratified by every country. The role of human activity in causing climate change has become a hotly debated socio political issue in some countries, including the United States. Thus, we enter the future with considerable uncertainty about our ability to curb human population growth and protect our environment. Link to learning visit this website, http colon slash slash openstacks dot org slash l slash populations closing parenthesis and select, launch movie, for an animation discussing the global impacts of human population growth. 45.6 Community Ecology By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Discuss the predator prey cycle. Give examples of defenses against predation and herbivora. Describe the competitive exclusion principle. Give examples of symbiotic relationships between species. Describe community structure and succession populations rarely, if ever, live in isolation from populations of other species. In most cases, numerous species share a habitat. The interactions between these populations play a major role in regulating population growth and abundance. All populations occupying the same habitat form a community, populations inhabiting a specific area at the same time. The number of species occupying the same habitat and their relative abundance is known as species diversity. Areas with low diversity, such as the glaciers of Antarctica, still contain a wide variety of living things, whereas the diversity of tropical rainforests is so great that it cannot be counted. 
Ecology is studied at the community level to understand how species interact with each other and compete for the same resources. Predation and herbivora perhaps the classical example of species interaction is predation, the consumption of prey by its predator. Nature shows on television highlight the drama of one living organism killing another. Populations of predators and prey in a community are not constant over time. In most cases, they vary in cycles that appear to be related. The most often cited example of predator prey dynamics is seen in the cycling of the lynx, predator, and the snowshoe hare, prey, using nearly 200 year old trapping data from North American forests, figure 45.18. This cycle of predator and prey lasts approximately 10 years, with the predator population lagging 1 to 2 years behind that of the prey population. As the hare numbers increase, there is more food available for the lynx, allowing the lynx population to increase as well. When the lynx population grows to a threshold level, however, they kill so many hares that hare population begins to decline, followed by a decline in the lynx population because of scarcity of food. When the lynx population is low, the hare population size begins to increase due, at least in part, to low predation pressure, starting the cycle anew. 1314 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStacks.org Figure 45.18 The cycling of lynx and snowshoe hare populations in northern Ontario is an example of predator-prey dynamics. Some researchers question the idea that predation models entirely control the population cycling of the two species. More recent studies have pointed to undefined density-dependent factors as being important in the cycling, in addition to predation. One possibility is that the cycling is inherent in the hare population due to density-dependent effects such as lower fecundity, maternal stress, caused by crowding when the hare population gets too dense. The hare cycling would then induce the cycling of the lynx because it is the lynx's major food source. The more we study communities, the more complexities we find, allowing ecologists to derive more accurate and sophisticated models of population dynamics. Herbivora describes the consumption of plants by insects and other animals, and it is another interspecific relationship that affects populations. Unlike animals, most plants cannot outrun predators or use mimicry to hide from hungry animals. Some plants have developed mechanisms to defend against herbivora. Other species have developed mutualistic relationships, for example, herbivora provides a mechanism of seed distribution that aids in plant reproduction. Defense mechanisms against predation and herbivora The study of communities must consider evolutionary forces that act on the members of the various populations contained within it. Species are not static, but slowly changing and adapting to their environment by natural selection and other evolutionary forces. Species have evolved numerous mechanisms to escape predation and herbivora. These defenses may be mechanical, chemical, physical, or behavioral. Mechanical defenses, such as the presence of thorns on plants or the hard shell on turtles, discourage animal predation and herbivora by causing physical pain to the predator or by physically preventing the predator from being able to eat the prey. Chemical defenses are produced by many animals as well as plants, such as the foxglove which is extremely toxic when eaten. Figure 45.19 shows some organisms' defenses against predation and herbivora. 45.6, Community Ecology 1315 Figure 45.19 The a, honey locust tree, Gladitia triacanthos, uses thorns, a mechanical defense, against herbivores, while the b. Florida red-bellied turtle, Pseudomys nelsoni, uses its shell as a mechanical defense against predators. c. Foxglove, Digitalis sp. uses a chemical defense. Toxins produced by the plant can cause nausea, vomiting, hallucinations, convulsions, or death when consumed. d. The North American millipede, Narcius americanus, uses both mechanical and chemical defenses. When threatened, the millipede curls into a defensive ball and produces a noxious substance that irritates eyes and skin. Credit a. Modification of work by Hugh Williams. Credit b. Modification of work by Jamie's 93 inches, Flicker. Credit C. Modification of work by Philip Jagenstedt. Credit D. Modification of work by Corey Zanker. Many species use their body shape and coloration to avoid being detected by predators. The tropical walking stick is an insect with the coloration and body shape of a twig which makes it very hard to see when stationary against a background of real twigs. 
figure 45.20a. In another example, the chameleon can, within limitations, change its color to match its surroundings, figure 45.20b. Both of these are examples of camouflage, or avoiding detection by blending in with the background. Figure 45.20a. Uh, the tropical walking stick and b. The chameleon use body shape and or coloration to prevent detection by predators. Credit a. Modification of work by Linda Tanner. Credit b. Modification of work by Frank Vassen. Some species use coloration as a way of warning predators that they are not good to eat. For example, the Cinnabar Moth 1316 Chapter 45. Population and Community Ecology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Caterpillar, the fire-bellied toad, and many species of beetle have bright colors that warn of a foul taste, the presence of toxic chemicals, and or the ability to sting or bite, respectively. Predators that ignore this coloration and eat the organisms will experience their unpleasant taste or presence of toxic chemicals and learn not to eat them in the future. This type of defensive mechanism is called aposmatic coloration, or warning coloration, figure 45.21. Figure 45.21, uh. The strawberry poison dart frog, Oophagia pumilio, uses aposmatic coloration to warn predators that it is toxic, while the, b, striped skunk, Mephitis mephitis, uses aposmatic coloration to warn predators of the unpleasant odor it produces. Credit a. Modification of work by J. Iwasaki. Credit B. Modification of work by Dan Zarishin. While some predators learn to avoid eating certain potential prey because of their coloration, other species have evolved mechanisms to mimic this coloration to avoid being eaten, even though they themselves may not be unpleasant to eat or contain toxic chemicals. In Batesian mimicry, a harmless species imitates the warning coloration of a harmful one. Assuming they share the same predators, this coloration then protects the harmless ones, even though they do not have the same level of physical or chemical defenses against predation as the organism they mimic. Many insect species mimic the coloration of wasps or bees, which are stinging, venomous insects, thereby discouraging predation. Figure 45.22. Figure 45.22 Batesian mimicry occurs when a harmless species mimics the coloration of a harmful species, as is seen with the a bumblebee and b b like robber fly. Credit A, B. Modification of work by Corey Zanker, in Malarian mimicry, multiple species share the same warning coloration, but all of them actually have defenses. Figure 45.23 shows a variety of foul-tasting butterflies with similar coloration. In Emslian, Mertensian mimicry, a deadly prey mimics a less dangerous one, such as the venomous coral snake mimicking the non-venomous milk snake. This type of mimicry is extremely rare and more difficult to understand than the previous two types. For this type of mimicry to work, it is essential that eating the milk snake has unpleasant but not fatal consequences. Then, these predators learn not to eat snakes with this coloration, protecting the coral snake as well. If the snake were fatal to the predator, there would be no opportunity for the predator to learn not to eat it, and the benefit for the less toxic species would disappear. 45.6, Community Ecology 1317 Figure 45.23 Several unpleasant-tasting Heliconius butterfly species share a similar color pattern with better-tasting varieties, an example of malarian mimicry. Credit. Joran M., Papa R., Beltron M., Chamberlain N., Mavarez J., et al. Link to learning go to this website http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash find underscore the underscore mimic closing parenthesis to view stunning examples of mimicry. Competitive exclusion principle resources are often limited within a habitat and multiple species may compete to obtain them. All species have an ecological niche in the ecosystem, which describes how they acquire the resources they need and how they interact with other species in the community. The competitive exclusion principle states that two species cannot occupy the same niche in a habitat. In other words, different species cannot coexist in a community if they are competing for all the same resources. An example of this principle is shown in figure 45.24, with two protozoan species, Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum. When grown individually in the laboratory, they both thrive. But when they are placed together in the same test tube, habitat, P. aurelia outcompetes P. caudatum for food, leading to the latter's eventual extinction. 
1318 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Figure 45.24 Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum grow well individually, but when they compete for the same resources, the P. aurelia outcompetes the P. caudatum. This exclusion may be avoided if a population evolves to make use of a different resource, a different area of the habitat, or feeds during a different time of day, called resource partitioning. The two organisms are then said to occupy different microniches. These organisms coexist by minimizing direct competition. Symbiosis symbiotic relationships, or symbioses, plural, are close interactions between individuals of different species over an extended period of time which impact the abundance and distribution of the associating populations. Most scientists accept this definition, but some restrict the term to only those species that are mutualistic, where both individuals benefit from the interaction. In this discussion, the broader definition will be used. Commensalism A commensal relationship occurs when one species benefits from the close, prolonged interaction, while the other neither benefits nor is harmed. Birds nesting in trees provide an example of a commensal relationship, figure 45.25. The tree is not harmed by the presence of the nest among its branches. The nests are light and produce little strain on the structural integrity of the branch, and most of the leaves, which the tree uses to get energy by photosynthesis, are above the nest so they are unaffected. The bird, on the other hand, benefits greatly. If the bird had to nest in the open, its eggs and young would be vulnerable to predators. Another example of a commensal relationship is the pilot fish and the shark. The pilot fish feed on the leftovers of the host's meals, and the host is not affected in any way. 45.6, Community Ecology 1319 Figure 45.25 The southern masked weaver bird is starting to make a nest in a tree in Zambezi Valley, Zambia. This is an example of a commensal relationship, in which one species, the bird, benefits, while the other, the tree, neither benefits nor is harmed. Credit. Hanai, Wikimedia Commons. Mutualism A second type of symbiotic relationship is called mutualism, where two species benefit from their interaction. Some scientists believe that these are the only true examples of symbiosis. For example, termites have a mutualistic relationship with protozoa that live in the insect's gut, figure 45.26a. The termite benefits from the ability of bacterial symbionts within the protozoa to digest cellulose. The termite itself cannot do this, and without the protozoa, it would not be able to obtain energy from its food, cellulose from the wood it chews and eats. The protozoa and the bacterial symbionts benefit by having a protective environment and a constant supply of food from the wood chewing actions of the termite. Lichens have a mutualistic relationship between fungus and photosynthetic algae or bacteria, figure 45.26b. As these symbionts grow together, the glucose produced by the algae provides nourishment for both organisms, whereas the physical structure of the lichen protects the algae from the elements and makes certain nutrients in the atmosphere more available to the algae. Figure 45.26, a. Uh, termites form a mutualistic relationship with symbiotic protozoa in their guts, which allow both organisms to obtain energy from the cellulose the termite consumes. b. Lichen is a fungus that has symbiotic photosynthetic algae living inside its cells. Credit A. Modification of work by Scott Bauer, USDA. Credit B. Modification of work by Corey Zanker. Parasitism A parasite is an organism that lives in or on another living organism and derives nutrients from it. In this relationship, the parasite benefits, but the host is harmed. The host is usually weakened by the parasite as it siphons resources the host would normally use to maintain itself. The parasite, however, is unlikely to kill the host, especially not quickly, because this would allow no time for the organism to complete its reproductive cycle by spreading to another host. The reproductive cycles of parasites are often very complex, sometimes requiring more than one host species. A tapeworm is a 1320 chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Parasite that causes disease in humans when contaminated, undercooked meat is consumed, figure 45.27. The tapeworm can live inside the intestine of the host for several years. Benefiting from the food the host is eating, and may grow to be over 50 feet long by adding segments. The parasite moves from species to species in a cycle, 
making two hosts necessary to complete its life cycle. Another common parasite is Plasmodium falciparum, the protozoan cause of malaria, a significant disease in many parts of the world. Living in human liver and red blood cells, the organism reproduces asexually in the gut of blood-feeding mosquitoes to complete its life cycle. Thus malaria is spread from human to human by mosquitoes, one of many arthropod-borne infectious diseases. Figure 45.27 This diagram shows the life cycle of a pork tapeworm, Tinea solium, a human worm parasite. Credit. Modification of work by CDC. Characteristics of communities Communities are complex entities that can be characterized by their structure, the types and numbers of species present, and dynamics, how communities change over time. Understanding community structure and dynamics enables community ecologists to manage ecosystems more effectively. Foundation species Foundation species are considered the base, or bedrock, of a community, having the greatest influence on its overall structure. They are usually the primary producers, organisms that bring most of the energy into the community. Kelp, or brown algae, is a foundation species, forming the basis of the kelp forests off the coast of California. Foundation species may physically modify the environment to produce and maintain habitats that benefit the other organisms that use them. An example is the photosynthetic corals of the coral reef, figure 45.28. Corals themselves are not photosynthetic, but harbor symbionts within their body tissues, dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae, that perform photosynthesis. This is another example of a mutualism. The exoskeletons of living and dead coral make up most of the reef structure, which protects many other species from waves and ocean currents. 45.6, Community Ecology 1321 Figure 45.28 Coral is the foundation species of coral reef ecosystems. Credit. Jim E. Maragos, USFWS, Biodiversity, Species Richness, and Relative Species Abundance Biodiversity describes a community's biological complexity. It is measured by the number of different species, species richness, in a particular area and their relative abundance, species evenness. The area in question could be a habitat, a biome, or the entire biosphere. Species richness is the term that is used to describe the number of species living in a habitat or biome. Species richness varies across the globe, figure 45.29. One factor in determining species richness is latitude, with the greatest species richness occurring in ecosystems near the equator, which often have warmer temperatures, large amounts of rainfall, and low seasonality. The lowest species richness occurs near the poles, which are much colder, drier, and thus less conducive to life in geologic time, time since glaciations. The predictability of climate or productivity is also an important factor. Other factors influence species richness as well. For example, the study of island biogeography attempts to explain the relatively high species richness found in certain isolated island chains, including the Galapagos Islands that inspired the young Darwin. Relative species abundance is the number of individuals in a species relative to the total number of individuals in all species within a habitat, ecosystem, or biome. Foundation species often have the highest relative abundance of species. Figure 45.29 The greatest species richness for mammals in North and South America is associated with the equatorial latitudes. Credit. Modification of work by NASA, CIESIN, Columbia University. Keystone species A keystone species is one whose presence is key to maintaining biodiversity within an ecosystem and to upholding an ecological community's structure. The intertidal sea star, Pisaster acrisius, of the northwestern United States is a keystone species, figure 45.30. Studies have shown that when this organism is removed from communities, populations of their natural prey, mussels, increase, completely altering the species' composition and reducing biodiversity. Another keystone species is the banded tetra, a fish in tropical streams, which supplies nearly all of the phosphorus, a necessary inorganic nutrient, to the rest 1322 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org, of the community. If these fish were to become extinct, the community would be greatly affected. Figure 45.30 The Pisaster acrisius sea star is a keystone species. Credit. Jerry Kirkhart, 
Everyday connection invasive species Invasive species are non-native organisms that, when introduced to an area out of their native range, threaten the ecosystem balance of that habitat. Many such species exist in the United States, as shown in Figure 45.31. Whether enjoying a forest hike, taking a summer boat trip, or simply walking down an urban street, you have likely encountered an invasive species. Figure 45.31 in the United States, invasive species like a purple loosestrife, Lithrum salicaria, and the b zebra mussel, Dracaena polymorpha, threaten certain aquatic ecosystems. Some forests are threatened by the spread of c common buckthorn, Romnus cathartica, d garlic mustard, Aliaria petiolata, and e the emerald ash borer, Agrilus planipennis. The f European starling, Sternus vulgaris, may compete with native bird species for nest holes. Credit A. Modification of work by Liz West. Credit B. Modification of work by M. McCormick, Noah. Credit C. Modification of work by E. Drunkard. Credit D. Modification of work by Dan Davison. Credit E. Modification of work by USDA. Credit F. Modification of work by Don Debold. One of the many recent proliferations of an invasive species concerns the growth of Asian carp populations. Asian carp were introduced to the United States in the 1970s by fisheries and sewage treatment facilities that used the fish's excellent filter feeding capabilities to clean their ponds of excess plankton. Some of the fish escaped, however, and by the 1980s they had colonized many waterways of the Mississippi River basin, including the Illinois and Missouri rivers. 45.6 Community Ecology 1323 Community Dynamics Community Dynamics are the changes in community structure and composition over time. Sometimes these changes are induced by environmental disturbances such as volcanoes, earthquakes, storms, fires, and climate change. Communities with a stable structure are said to be at equilibrium. Following a disturbance, the community may or may not return to the equilibrium state. Succession describes the sequential appearance and disappearance of species in a community over time. In primary succession, newly exposed or newly formed land is colonized by living things. In secondary succession, part of an ecosystem is disturbed and remnants of the previous community remain. Primary succession and pioneer species Primary succession occurs when new land is formed or rock is exposed. For example, following the eruption of volcanoes, such as those on the Big Island of Hawaii. As lava flows into the ocean, new land is continually being formed. On the Big Island, approximately 32 acres of land is added each year. First, weathering and other natural forces break down the substrate enough for the establishment of certain hardy plants and lichens with few soil requirements, known as pioneer species, figure 45.32. These species help to further break down the mineral-rich lava into soil where other less hardy species will grow and eventually replace the pioneer species. In addition, as these early species grow and die, they add to an ever-growing layer of decomposing organic material and contribute to soil formation. Over time the area will reach an equilibrium state, with a set of organisms quite different from the pioneer species. Voracious eaters and rapid reproducers, Asian carp may outcompete native species for food, potentially leading to their extinction. For example, Black carp are voracious eaters of native mussels and snails, limiting this food source for native fish species. Silver carp eat plankton that native mussels and snails feed on, reducing this food source by a different alteration of the food web. In some areas of the Mississippi River, Asian carp species have become the most predominant, effectively outcompeting native fishes for habitat. In some parts of the Illinois River, Asian carp constitute 95% of the community's biomass. Although edible, the fish is bony and not a desired food in the United States. Moreover, their presence threatens the native fish and fisheries of the Great Lakes, which are important to local economies and recreational anglers. Asian carp have even injured humans. The fish, frightened by the sound of approaching motorboats, thrust themselves into the air, often landing in the boat or directly hitting the boaters. The Great Lakes and their prized salmon and lake trout fisheries are also being threatened by these invasive fish. Asian carp have already colonized rivers and canals that lead into Lake Michigan. One infested waterway of particular importance is the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Channel, the major supply waterway linking the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River. 
To prevent the Asian carp from leaving the canal, a series of electric barriers have been successfully used to discourage their migration. However, the threat is significant enough that several states and Canada have sued to have the Chicago Channel permanently cut off from Lake Michigan. Local and national politicians have weighed in on how to solve the problem, but no one knows whether the Asian carp will ultimately be considered a nuisance, like other invasive species such as the water hyacinth and zebra mussel, or whether it will be the destroyer of the largest freshwater fishery of the world. The issues associated with Asian carp show how population and community ecology, fisheries management, and politics intersect on issues of vital importance to the human food supply and economy. Sociopolitical issues like this make extensive use of the sciences of population ecology, the study of members of a particular species occupying a particular area known as a habitat, and community ecology, the study of the interaction of all species within a habitat. 1324 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStacks.org Figure 45.32 During primary succession in lava on Maui, Hawaii, succulent plants are the pioneer species. Credit. Forrest and Kim Starr. Secondary succession A classic example of secondary succession occurs in oak and hickory forests cleared by wildfire. Figure 45.33 Wildfires will burn most vegetation and kill those animals unable to flee the area. Their nutrients, however, are returned to the ground in the form of ash. Thus, even when areas are devoid of life due to severe fires, the area will soon be ready for new life to take hold. Before the fire, the vegetation was dominated by tall trees with access to the major plant energy resource, sunlight. Their height gave them access to sunlight while also shading the ground and other low-lying species. After the fire, though, these trees are no longer dominant. Thus, the first plants to grow back are usually annual plants followed within a few years by quickly growing and spreading grasses and other pioneer species. Due to, at least in part, changes in the environment brought on by the growth of the grasses and other species, over many years, shrubs will emerge along with small pine, oak, and hickory trees. These organisms are called intermediate species. Eventually, over 150 years, the forest will reach its equilibrium point where species composition is no longer changing and resembles the community before the fire. This equilibrium state is referred to as the climax community, which will remain stable until the next disturbance. Figure 45.33 Secondary succession is shown in an oak and hickory forest after a forest fire. 45.7 Behavioral biology. Proximate and ultimate causes of behavior by the end of this section. You will be able to do the following. Compare innate and learned behavior. Discuss how movement and migration behaviors are a result of natural selection. Discuss the different ways members of a population communicate with each other. Give examples of how species use energy for mating displays and other courtship behaviors. Differentiate between various mating systems. Describe different ways that species learn behavior as the change in activity of an organism in response to a stimulus. Behavioral biology is the study of the biological and evolutionary basis for such changes. The idea that behaviors evolved as a result of the pressures of natural selection is not new. 45.7. Behavioral biology. Proximate and ultimate causes of behavior 1325 for decades. Several types of scientists have studied animal behavior. Biologists do so in the science of ethology. Psychologists in the science of comparative psychology and other scientists in the science of neurobiology. The first two, ethology and comparative psychology, are the most consequential for the study of behavioral biology. One goal of behavioral biology is to distinguish between the innate behaviors, which have a strong genetic component and are largely independent of environmental influences, from the learned behaviors, which result from environmental conditioning. Innate behavior, or instinct, is important because there is no risk of an incorrect behavior being learned. They are hardwired into the system. On the other hand, learned behaviors, although riskier, are flexible, dynamic, and can be altered according to changes in the environment. Innate behaviors. Movement and migration innate or instinctual behaviors rely on response to stimuli. The simplest example of this is a reflex action, an involuntary and rapid response to stimulus. To test the knee-jerk reflex, a doctor taps the patellar tendon below the kneecap with a rubber hammer. The stimulation of the nerves leads to the reflex of extending the leg at the knee. 
This is similar to the reaction of someone who touches a hot stove and instinctually pulls his or her hand away. Even humans, with our great capacity to learn, still exhibit a variety of innate behaviors. Kinesis and taxis Another activity or movement of innate behavior is kinesis, or the undirected movement in response to a stimulus. Orthokinesis is the increased or decreased speed of movement of an organism in response to a stimulus. Woodlice, for example, increase their speed of movement when exposed to high or low temperatures. This movement, although random, increases the probability that the insect spends less time in the unfavorable environment. Another example is clinokinesis, an increase in turning behaviors. It is exhibited by bacteria such as E. coli which, in association with orthokinesis, helps the organisms randomly find a more hospitable environment. A similar, but more directed version of kinesis is taxis, the directed movement towards or away from a stimulus. This movement can be in response to light, phototaxis, chemical signals, chemotaxis, or gravity, geotaxis, and can be directed toward, positive, or away, negative, from the source of the stimulus. An example of a positive chemotaxis is exhibited by the unicellular protozoan Tetrahymena thermophila. This organism swims using its cilia, at times moving in a straight line, and at other times making turns. The attracting chemotactic agent alters the frequency of turning as the organism moves directly toward the source, following the increasing concentration gradient. Fixed action patterns A fixed action pattern is a series of movements elicited by a stimulus such that even when the stimulus is removed, the pattern goes on to completion. An example of such a behavior occurs in the three-spined stickleback, a small freshwater fish, figure 45.34. Males of this species develop a red belly during breeding season and show instinctual aggressiveness to other males during this time. In laboratory experiments, researchers exposed such fish to objects that in no way resemble a fish in their shape, but which were painted red on their lower halves. The male sticklebacks responded aggressively to the objects just as if they were real male sticklebacks. Figure 45.34 Male 3 spined stickleback fish exhibit a fixed action pattern. During mating season, the males, which develop a bright red belly, react strongly to red-bottomed objects that in no way resemble fish. Migration Migration is the long-range seasonal movement of animals. It is an evolved, adapted response to variation in Resource 1326 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Availability, and it is a common phenomenon found in all major groups of animals. Birds fly south for the winter to get to warmer climates with sufficient food, and salmon migrate to their spawning grounds. The popular 2005 documentary March of the Penguins followed the 62-mile migration of emperor penguins through Antarctica to bring food back to their breeding site and to their young. Wildebeests, figure 45.35, migrate over 1,800 miles each year in search of new grasslands. Figure 45.35 Wildebeests migrate in a clockwise fashion over 1,800 miles each year in search of rain-ripened grass. Credit. Eric and Afuku. Although migration is thought of as innate behavior, only some migrating species always migrate, obligate migration. Animals that exhibit facultative migration can choose to migrate or not. Additionally, in some animals, only a portion of the population migrates whereas the rest does not migrate, incomplete migration. For example, owls that live in the tundra may migrate in years when their food source, small rodents, is relatively scarce, but not migrate during the years when rodents are plentiful. Foraging Foraging is the act of searching for and exploiting food resources. Feeding behaviors that maximize energy gain and minimize energy expenditure are called optimal foraging behaviors, and these are favored by natural section. The painted stork, for example, uses its long beak to search the bottom of a freshwater marshland for crabs and other food, figure 45.36. Figure 45.36 The painted stork uses its long beak to forage. Credit. J. M. Garg, Innate Behaviors. Living in groups Not all animals live in groups, but even those that live relatively solitary lives, with the exception of those that can reproduce asexually, must mate. Mating usually involves one animal signaling another so as to communicate the desire to mate. There are several types of energy-intensive behaviors or displays associated with mating, called mating rituals. 
Other behaviors found in populations that live in groups are described in terms of which animal benefits from the behavior. In selfish behavior, only the animal in question benefits. In altruistic behavior, one animal's actions benefit another animal. Cooperative behavior describes when both animals benefit. All of these behaviors involve some sort of communication between population members. Communication within a species animals communicate with each other using stimuli known as signals. An example of this is seen in the three spined stickleback, where the visual signal of a red region in the lower half of a fish signals males to become aggressive and signals females to mate. Other signals are chemical, pheromones, oral, sound, visual, courtship, and aggressive displays, or tactile, touch. These types of communication may be instinctual or learned or a combination of both. These are not the same as the 45.7, behavioral biology, proximate and ultimate causes of behavior 1327 communication we associate with language, which has been observed only in humans and perhaps in some species of primates and cetaceans. A pheromone is a secreted chemical signal used to obtain a response from another individual of the same species. The purpose of pheromones is to elicit a specific behavior from the receiving individual. Pheromones are especially common among social insects, but they are used by many species to attract the opposite sex, to sound alarms, to mark food trails, and to elicit other, more complex behaviors. Even humans are thought to respond to certain pheromones called axillary steroids. These chemicals influence human perception of other people, and in one study were responsible for a group of women synchronizing their menstrual cycles. The role of pheromones in human to human communication is not fully understood and continues to be researched. Songs are an example of an oral signal, one that needs to be heard by the recipient. Perhaps the best known of these are songs of birds, which identify the species and are used to attract mates. Other well known songs are those of whales, which are of such low frequency that they can travel long distances underwater. Dolphin species communicate with each other. And occasionally, even with other species of dolphins, using a wide variety of vocalizations. Male crickets make chirping sounds using a specialized organ to attract a mate, repel other males, and to announce a successful mating. Courtship displays are a series of ritualized visual behaviors, signals, designed to attract and convince a member of the opposite sex to mate. These displays are ubiquitous in the animal kingdom. Often, these displays involve a series of steps. Including an initial display by one member followed by a response from the other. If at any point, the display is performed incorrectly or a proper response is not given, the mating ritual is abandoned and the mating attempt will be unsuccessful. The mating display of the common stork is shown in figure 45.37. Aggressive displays are also common in the animal kingdom. For example, a dog bares its teeth when it wants another dog to back down. Presumably, these displays communicate not only the willingness of the animal to fight, but also its fighting ability. Although these displays do signal aggression on the part of the sender, it is thought that these displays are actually a mechanism to reduce the amount of actual fighting that occurs between members of the same species. They allow individuals to assess the fighting ability of their opponent and thus decide whether it is worth the fight. The testing of certain hypotheses using game theory has led to the conclusion that some of these displays may overstate an animal's actual fighting ability and are used to bluff the opponent. This type of interaction, even if dishonest, would be favored by natural selection if it is successful more times than not. Figure 45.37 This stork's courtship display is designed to attract potential mates. Credit. Linda, Jinterwas, Flicker, distraction displays are seen in birds and some fish. They are designed to attract a predator away from the nest. This is an example of an altruistic behavior. It benefits the young more than the individual performing the display, which is putting itself at risk by doing so. Many animals, especially primates, communicate with other members in the group through touch. Activities such as grooming, touching the shoulder or root of the tail, embracing, lip contact, and greeting ceremonies have all been observed in the Indian langur, an old world monkey. Similar behaviors are found in other primates, especially in the great apes. Linked to learning, the killdeer bird distracts predators from its eggs by faking a broken wing display in this video taken in Boise, Idaho. 1328 Chapter 45 Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org.
click to view content https colon slash slash www.openstacks.org slash l slash killdeer underscore bird closing parenthesis altruistic behaviors behaviors that lower the fitness of the individual but increase the fitness of another individual are termed altruistic examples of such behaviors are seen widely across the animal kingdom social insects such as worker bees have no ability to reproduce yet they maintain the queen so she can populate the hive with her offspring meerkats keep a sentry standing guard to warn the rest of the colony about intruders even though the sentry is putting itself at risk wolves and wild dogs bring meat to pack members not present during a hunt lemurs take care of infants unrelated to them although on the surface these behaviors appear to be altruistic the truth may not be so simple there has been much discussion over why altruistic behaviors exist do these behaviors lead to overall evolutionary advantages for their species do they help the altruistic individual pass on its own genes and what about such activities between unrelated individuals one explanation for altruistic type behaviors is found in the genetics of natural selection in the 1976 book the selfish gene scientist richard dawkins attempted to explain many seemingly altruistic behaviors from the viewpoint of the gene itself although a gene obviously cannot be selfish in the human sense it may appear that way if the sacrifice of an individual benefits related individuals that share genes that are identical by descent present in relatives because of common lineage mammal parents make this sacrifice to take care of their offspring Emperor penguins migrate miles in harsh conditions to bring food back for their young. Selfish gene theory has been controversial over the years and is still discussed among scientists in related fields. Even less related individuals, those with less genetic identity than that shared by parent and offspring, benefit from seemingly altruistic behavior. The activities of social insects such as bees, wasps, ants, and termites are good examples. Sterile workers in these societies take care of the queen because they are closely related to it, and as the queen has offspring, she is passing on genes from the workers indirectly. Thus, it is of fitness benefit for the worker to maintain the queen without having any direct chance of passing on its genes due to its sterility. The lowering of individual fitness to enhance the reproductive fitness of a relative and thus one's inclusive fitness evolves through kin selection. This phenomenon can explain many superficially altruistic behaviors seen in animals. However, these behaviors may not be truly defined as altruism in these cases because the actor is actually increasing its own fitness either directly, through its own offspring, or indirectly, through the inclusive fitness it gains through relatives that share genes with it. Unrelated individuals may also act altruistically to each other, and this seems to defy the selfish gene explanation. An example of this observed in many monkey species where a monkey will present its back to an unrelated monkey to have that individual pick the parasites from its fur. After a certain amount of time, the roles are reversed and the first monkey now grooms the second monkey. Thus, there is reciprocity in the behavior. Both benefit from the interaction and their fitness is raised more than if neither cooperated nor if one cooperated and the other did not cooperate. This behavior is still not necessarily altruism, as the giving behavior of the actor is based on the expectation that it will be the receiver of the behavior in the future, termed reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism requires that individuals repeatedly encounter each other, often the result of living in the same social group, and that cheaters, those that never give back, are punished. Evolutionary game theory, a modification of classical game theory in mathematics, has shown that many of these so-called altruistic behaviors are not altruistic at all. The definition of pure altruism, based on human behavior, is an action that benefits another without any direct benefit to oneself. Most of the behaviors previously described do not seem to satisfy this definition, and game theorists are good at finding selfish components in them. Others have argued that the terms selfish and altruistic should be dropped completely when discussing animal behavior as they describe human behavior and may not be directly applicable to instinctual animal activity. What is clear, though, is that heritable behaviors that improve the chances of passing on one's genes or a portion of one's genes are favored by natural selection and will be retained in future generations as long as those behaviors convey a fitness advantage. These instinctual behaviors may then be applied, in special circumstances, to other species, as long as it doesn't lower the animal's fitness. Finding sex partners not all animals reproduce sexually, but many that do have the same challenge, 
They need to find a suitable mate and often have to compete with other individuals to obtain one. Significant energy is spent in the process of locating, attracting, and mating with the sex partner. Two types of selection occur during this process. Intersexual selection, where individuals of one sex choose mates of the other sex, and intrasexual selection, the competition for mates between species members of the same sex. Intersexual selection is often complex because choosing a mate may be based on a variety of visual, oral, tactile, and chemical 45.7. Behavioral biology, proximate and ultimate causes of behavior 1329 cues. An example of intersexual selection is when female peacocks choose to mate with the male with the brightest plumage. This type of selection often leads to traits in the chosen sex that do not enhance survival, but are those traits most attractive to the opposite sex, often at the expense of survival. Intrasexual selection involves mating displays and aggressive mating. Rituals such as rams butting heads, The winner of these battles is the one that is able to mate. Many of these rituals use up considerable energy but result in the selection of the healthiest, strongest, and or most dominant individuals for mating. Three general mating systems, all involving innate as opposed to learned behaviors, are seen in animal populations monogamous, polygynous, and polyandrous. Link to learning visit this website. http colon slash slash openstacks dot org slash l slash sex underscore selection closing parenthesis for informative videos on sexual selection. In monogamous systems, one male and one female are paired for at least one breeding season. In some animals, such as the gray wolf, these associations can last much longer, even a lifetime. Several theories may explain this type of mating system. The mate guarding hypothesis. States that males stay with the female to prevent other males from mating with her. This behavior is advantageous in such situations where mates are scarce and difficult to find. Another explanation is the male assistance hypothesis, where males that help guard and rear their young will have more and healthier offspring. Monogamy is observed in many bird populations where, in addition to the parental care from the female, the male is also a major provider of parental care for the chicks. A third explanation for the evolutionary advantages of monogamy is the female enforcement hypothesis. In this scenario, the female ensures that the male does not have other offspring that might compete with her own, so she actively interferes with the male's signaling to attract other mates. Polygynous mating refers to one male mating with multiple females. In these situations, the female must be responsible for most of the parental care as the single male is not capable of providing care to that many offspring. In resource based polygyny, males compete for territories with the best resources, and then mate with females that enter the territory, drawn to its resource richness. The female benefits by mating with a dominant, genetically fit male. However, it is at the cost of having no male help in caring for the offspring. An example is seen in the yellow rumped honey guide, a bird whose males defend beehives because the females feed on their wax. As the females approach, the male defending the nest will mate with them. Harem mating structures are a type of polygynous system where certain males dominate mating while controlling a territory with resources. Harem mating occurs in elephant seals, where the alpha male dominates the mating within the group. A third type of polygyny is a lek system. Here there is a communal courting area where several males perform elaborate displays for females, and the females choose their mate from this group. This behavior is observed in several bird species, including the sage grouse and the prairie chicken. In polyandrous mating systems, one female mates with many males. These types of systems are much rarer than monogamous and polygynous mating systems. In pipe fishes and seahorses, males receive the eggs from the female, fertilize them, protect them within a pouch, and give birth to the offspring. Figure 45.38. Therefore, the female is able to provide eggs to several males without the burden of carrying the fertilized eggs. Figure 45.38 Polyandrous mating, in which one female mates with many males, occurs in the a seahorse and the b pipefish. Credit a modification of work by Brian Gratwick. Credit b modification of work by Stephen Childs, 1330 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStacks.org. Simple learned behaviors. The majority of the behaviors previously discussed were innate or at least have an innate component. Variations on the innate behaviors may be learned. They are inherited and the behaviors do not change in response to signals from the environment. 
Conversely, learned behaviors, even though they may have instinctive components, allow an organism to adapt to changes in the environment and are modified by previous experiences. Simple learned behaviors include habituation and imprinting. Both are important to the maturation process of young animals. Habituation Habituation is a simple form of learning in which an animal stops responding to a stimulus after a period of repeated exposure. This is a form of non-associative learning, as the stimulus is not associated with any punishment or reward. Prairie dogs typically sound an alarm call when threatened by a predator, but they become habituated to the sound of human footsteps when no harm is associated with this sound. Therefore, they no longer respond to them with an alarm call. In this example, habituation is specific to the sound of human footsteps, as the animals still respond to the sounds of potential predators. Imprinting Imprinting is a type of learning that occurs at a particular age or a life stage that is rapid and independent of the species involved. Hatchling ducks recognize the first adult they see, their mother, and make a bond with her. A familiar sight is ducklings walking or swimming after their mothers, figure 45.39. This is another type of non-associative learning, but is very important in the maturation process of these animals as it encourages them to stay near their mother so they will be protected, greatly increasing their chances of survival. However, if newborn ducks see a human before they see their mother, they will imprint on the human and follow it in just the same manner as they would follow their real mother. Figure 45.39 The attachment of ducklings to their mother is an example of imprinting. Credit. Modification of work by Mark Harkin. Link to learning the International Crane Foundation has helped raise the world's population of whooping cranes from 21 individuals to about 600. Imprinting hatchlings has been a key to success. Biologists wear full crane costumes so the birds never see humans. Watch this video to learn more. Click to view content, https colon slash slash www.openstacks.org slash l slash whooping underscore crane closing parenthesis conditioned behavior conditioned behaviors are types of associative learning, where a stimulus becomes associated with a consequence. During operant conditioning, the behavioral response is modified by its consequences, with regards to its form, strength, or frequency. Classical conditioning and classical conditioning. A response called the conditioned response is associated with a stimulus that it had previously not been associated with, the conditioned stimulus. The response to the original, unconditioned stimulus is called the unconditioned response. The most cited example of classical conditioning is Ivan Pavlov's experiments with dogs, figure 45.40. In Pavlov's experiments, the unconditioned response was the salivation of dogs in response to the unconditioned stimulus of seeing or smelling their food. The conditioning stimulus that researchers associated with the unconditioned response was the ringing of a bell. During conditioning, every time the animal was given food, the bell was rung. This was repeated during several trials. After some time, the dog learned to associate the ringing of the bell with food and to respond by salivating. After the 45.7, Behavioral Biology, Proximate and Ultimate Causes of Behavior 1331 conditioning period was finished, the dog would respond by salivating when the bell was rung, even when the unconditioned stimulus, the food, was absent. Thus, the ringing of the bell became the conditioned stimulus and the salivation became the conditioned response. Although it is thought by some scientists that the unconditioned and conditioned responses are identical, even Pavlov discovered that the saliva in the conditioned dogs had characteristic differences when compared to the unconditioned dog. Figure 45.40 In the classic Pavlovian response, the dog becomes conditioned to associate the ringing of the bell with food. It had been thought by some scientists that this type of conditioning required multiple exposures to the paired stimulus and response, but it is now known that this is not necessary in all cases, and that some conditioning can be learned in a single pairing experiment. Classical conditioning is a major tenet of behaviorism, a branch of psychological philosophy that proposes that all actions, thoughts, and emotions of living things are behaviors that can be treated by behavior modification and changes in the environment. Operant conditioning and operant conditioning. The conditioned behavior is gradually modified by its consequences as the animal responds to the stimulus. A major proponent of such conditioning was psychologist B. F. Skinner, the inventor of the Skinner box. Skinner put rats in his boxes that contained a lever that would dispense food to the rat when depressed. 
While initially the rat would push the lever a few times by accident, it eventually associated pushing the lever with getting the food. This type of learning is an example of operant conditioning. Operant learning is the basis of most animal training. The conditioned behavior is continually modified by positive or negative reinforcement, often a reward such as food or some type of punishment, respectively. In this way, the animal is conditioned to associate a type of behavior with the punishment or reward, and, over time, can be induced to perform behaviors that they would not have done in the wild, such as the tricks dolphins perform at marine amusement park shows. Figure 45.41. Figure 45.41 The training of dolphins by rewarding them with food is an example of positive reinforcement operant conditioning. Credit. Roland Tangleo. Cognitive learning classical and operant conditioning are inefficient ways for humans and other intelligent animals to learn. Some primates, including humans, are able to learn by imitating the behavior of others and by taking instructions. The development of complex language by humans has made cognitive learning, the manipulation of information using the mind, the most prominent 1332 Chapter 45, Population and Community Ecology Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Method of human learning. In fact, that is how students are learning right now by reading this book. As students read, they can make mental images of objects or organisms and imagine changes to them, or behaviors by them, and anticipate the consequences. In addition to visual processing, cognitive learning is also enhanced by remembering past experiences, touching physical objects, hearing sounds, tasting food, and a variety of other sensory based inputs. Cognitive learning is so powerful that it can be used to understand conditioning in detail. In the reverse scenario, conditioning cannot help someone learn about cognition. Classic work on cognitive learning was done by Wolfgang Kohler with chimpanzees. He demonstrated that these animals were capable of abstract thought by showing that they could learn how to solve a puzzle. When a banana was hung in their cage too high for them to reach, and several boxes were placed randomly on the floor, some of the chimps were able to stack the boxes one on top of the other, climb on top of them, and get the banana. This implies that they could visualize the result of stacking the boxes even before they had performed the action. This type of learning is much more powerful and versatile than conditioning. Cognitive learning is not limited to primates, although they are the most efficient in using it. Maze running experiments done with rats by H. C. Blodgett in the 1920s were the first to show cognitive skills in a simple mammal. The motivation for the animals to work their way through the maze was a piece of food at its end. In these studies, the animals in group 1 were run in one trial per day and had food available to them each day on completion of the run, figure 45.42.